Welcome to Cure America. I'm Star Parker. We are delighted you have joined us today via NRB TV, the TCT Network on DirecTV, or on streaming services Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, or wherever you are watching. We appreciate you and welcome your support. We're a voice of hope in the midst of a world in need of hope. But some of the voices you may want to hear, especially biblical Christian voices, are being shut down in silence. This is a new cancel culture where individual views on issues from politics and political uh, to moral and biblical principles are considered out of the mainstream of culture. Canceled is a term for what happens when people, most often on social media, but increasingly in real life, together and employ shaming tactics to block a person from having a platform. It can mean boycotting businesses, refusing to consume an author's book, a film, uh, or pressuring friends, colleagues, and activists to denounce a person and an association with them. Today's cancel culture is not about free speech or debate. It is not about social justice. The power to get someone fired strengthens the mob mentality Continue down this road. And with the help of big tech companies like Amazon and Twitter, Google, Facebook, the power is in the hands of the mob, especially if you're a biblical uh, person, a Bible-believing Christian. Your views can easily be shut down by social media platforms or television outlets. Recently, Lifetime TV demanded D. James Kenneth D. Ministries eliminate all controversial content from its weekly half-hour Christian broadcast. That content included pro-life messaging. Despite the high-dollar contract with the network, D. James Kennedy Ministry was forced off the air on that particular network. In February, Max Licato apologized in a letter to Washington National Cathedral after his invitation to preach in a cathedral worship service sparked outrage over his past statements about homosexuality and same-sex marriage. The National Cathedral has hosted religious leaders from almost every denomination, but Max Licato's views were not welcomed. These are startling scenarios. What's happening in our country? How did we let this happen, and what do we do about it? We'll delve into all of this on today's show, Cure America. Unfortunately, this cancel culture has been going on longer than we think. We will share with you the story of former Atlanta Fire Chief Kelvin Cochran, who lost his job six years ago after writing about traditional marriage in a men's devotional book. He had to take his case all the way to the Supreme Court to defend his ability to think and believe in traditional Christian values and to be able to express those views. We will also talk about more recent situations like our friend Ryan Anderson, whose book When Harry Became Sally was taken off Amazon.com because of its content on transgenderism. Oh, and our dear friend Rush Limbaugh was always a target of the cancel culture and the left when they tried to get him off the air for over 30 years. A sitting president, Donald Trump, was canceled by Twitter and Facebook after the January 6th attack at the Capitol. Parler, a conservative alternative to Twitter, was deplatformed by Amazon. Senator Josh Hawley's book, Contract with Simon & Schuster, was canceled after his focus on voter integrity after the 2020 election. Even vulgar liberals like Bill Maher are sounding the alarm over the cancel culture, noting that a Pew survey and study showed that 62 percent of Americans are afraid to share their political views in public. Our political views and our Christian views can be subject to this cancel culture. Even my work at Cure has been targeted by groups that don't like our positions on issues of abortion, sexuality, or race. Last summer, we ran billboards that were a target of this some who wanted to stop our work. So we need to think about these things. When even Kermit the Frog, Dr. Seuss, and Mr. Potato Head are on the chopping block, where will this stop? We will discuss these issues with our distinguished panel and talk with our friend Michael Pack, the former head of the U.S. Agency for Global Media, whose film on Justice Clarence Thomas was deleted from Amazon for no apparent reason, while films on Anita Hill or Ruth Gator Ginsburg or Thurgood Marshall remained. 
What is our responsibility in the marketplace where our worldview may be shut down? Do we protest or boycott? Or do we develop our own platforms to speak to the millions of Americans who agree with our values? And what role, if any, does government play in this? There is a move by some in Congress to shame companies from advertising on networks like Fox News or One American News Network. There have been other attempts over the years to get rid of religious program from cable and satellite packages. So let's cut through the noise of the news and get behind the scenes and behind the ideology of shutting down alternative points of view. We'll start by sharing the compelling story of Kelvin Cochran, the Atlanta Fire Chief, and his story of how the cancel culture came after him. And we will do this after this important message. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Right now, we're in Alaska unloading a hospital for uh, COVID-19. But right now, our country is in trouble, and people are scared, people are afraid, and we see the violence and the injustices that are taking place. Only God can change this. Uh, this is a problem of the human heart. And we have sinned against God, and as a nation, we've turned our back on God. And I want you to know that God loves you, He cares for you, and He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to this earth to take our sins. And if we'll confess them and repent, turn from them and believe on His Son, Jesus Christ, God will forgive us and He'll heal our hearts. If you have never invited Christ into your heart, pray this prayer with me right now to say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry, forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I want to trust him as my savior. I want to follow him as Lord from this day forward forever. Amen. Call that number right now that's on the screen. We've got someone who will pray with you, talk with you, and encourage you. God bless. It's time for a cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, D.C., CURE works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. CURE's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo-Christian perspective. CURE, join with us. There has never been a better time to help black communities. When I was growing up in Shreveport, the grown-ups asked us all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my answers were always the same. I told them that I did not want to be poor because we were very poor, that I wanted a family because my dad had left my mother, and that I wanted to be a firefighter. Being one of the first African Americans on the Shreveport Fire Department had significant challenges. There was a designated bed in the dormitory for the black firefighter. We had designated plates, forks and spoons, so that no one would eat from the same plates, forks and spoons of the black firefighter. It gave me a conviction that should I ever be in a position of leadership, that I would never allow anyone to have the same experience I had as a minority. And so when I became fire chief, I instituted having no racism, sexism, territorialism, favoritism, uh, cronyism, or any ism that would interfere with a wholesome work environment for any people group within the fire department. Eight years after serving as fire chief in Shreveport, I was appointed fire chief in the city of Atlanta. President Obama was elected, and he appointed me to the highest fire official in the United States of America, the United States Fire Administrator. And I loved that job and was serving there for about 10 months. The city of Atlanta elected a new mayor and recruited me back to the city of Atlanta, and I served him for five years when I was terminated from employment. Given the efforts that uh, myself as Fire Chief of Atlanta and our group put together uh, in creating this inclusive, diverse, uh, tolerant organization, I was really surprised that writing a book for a Christian men Bible study, 162 pages encouraging men to be the husbands and fathers and leaders that God has called us to be, 
uh, would put me in an adverse position against the city of Atlanta because of a few pages I wrote explaining biblical marriage and biblical sexuality. In fact, the city of Atlanta conducted an investigation and found out that I had never discriminated against anyone. However, I was terminated after my 30-day suspension in spite of that. After having lived a life of discrimination, providing leadership that eliminates discrimination was a high priority for me. So having been terminated for the perception of discrimination was very, very hurtful and really drives my passion for seeking justice and the fight for truth. Yes, I told you I did, and my goodness, Michael Pack is an award-winning filmmaker and just recently departed head of the U.S. Agency for Global Media, the government agency that oversees all non-military U.S. international broadcasting funded by the U.S. Congress. As writer, director, and producer, his acclaimed films include Rick Over and his most recent film, Created Equal, Clarence Thomas in his own words, which is what we're going to talk about today. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, you're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> you know, we've been hearing about and thinking about yeah. and wondering about this cancel culture. A lot of people yeah, wondering, indeed. am I going to be next? And then we find out that, well, so Clarence Thomas, uh, documentary, actually, a well-thought look at his life, a United States Supreme Justice's <laughs> life, uh, you can't get it on Amazon. Well, that's right. We made this documentary, as you said, called Credit Equal, Clarence Thomas in His Own Words. It aired on PBS in June. Uh, it, did, it was in theaters before that. It did well. It was well received, got good reviews in places like the Washington Post, not always friendly to mm -mm. Uh, Justice Thomas. And did well on PBS, and it was on Amazon starting in October. Mm -hmm. And then on February 8th, in the beginning of Black History Month, they pulled it from Prime, and they also stopped the sort of buy rent option. I mean, they're still selling DVDs, although they're not available on Amazon. So they essentially pulled it without warning on February 8th, and we repeatedly asked them why, and they gave no reason. Okay. And people have repeatedly asked them to put it back. I mean, it could be an oversight, could be anything. But well, it couldn't have been, because it's yeah, been it everywhere. Been. And now all of a sudden, it's pulled. And I think that the, many of us are now aware that there's this insidiousness going on in this movement to make sure that people just pretty much disappear. And they will pressure even companies like Amazon. So I'm wondering if that's what's happened. But because that seems odd, but mm. it's not odd. It's mixed in with a whole lot right, of other things right. that have been going on. So where do you think that this is going to lead? Like, wh when you say they took it down, they just said, okay, we're not going to distribute this product anymore. Where do you think mm. that line is between a company that has a right to do that, to decide what products they want up on them, and the right for people to distribute, especially if that's the major distributor? Well, it is a tricky question. I mean, you, your viewers can see the film. It is on other platforms. If they go it's to- It's on your platform. If they go to our website, manifoldproductions.com, M-A-N-I-F-O-L-D, productions.com, uh, mm -hmm. they can find out where else it is. It's on, on iTunes, it's on Verizon, it's on YouTube. And you can buy DVDs from our from that website, although thanks to Amazon canceling it, the DVDs are way back ordered, so people ordering them should be patient. Mm -hmm. But your point about Amazon is well taken. People still expect it to be on Amazon, want it to be on Amazon. They're not going to the other platforms in the same numbers. So Amazon has a disproportionate power in this marketplace. But I do beg. So, do you think of power like a, as a monopoly? Like, is this where government needs to regulate? Because you know, we don't have to buy our product from Amazon. Well, that's right. It's kind of like we don't have to buy our product from from Walmart. But these are now big conglomerates that people have grown accustomed to going somewhere to get things. But I'm sure they don't carry every video that's made uh, in the world. So, what I'm just really trying to sort through to find some truth in where energy should be. You're saying that they gave you no explanation. They're just one day. You're, that's it. So do you think it's because of the content? Is this a 
Is this, are we at the place where we are being censored as a people? Well, I'm, I'm not sure, As sir. a conservative people, I should since, say. since they didn't tell me, I'm not sure. Okay. I mean, the reasons they sometimes give is that it's not selling enough, there's not adequate attention, but at one point we were number one in documentaries. Yeah, I was going to say, this one has sold, and there are other ones that have been, uh, that are up there that are not selling. Amazon has a whole but, lot of product that but, doesn't sell well. And, and our film is not conservative propaganda. It's, mm -hmm. it, you know, we were lucky and we were able to interview Justice Thomas and his wife Ginny, and they're the only ones that speak, and it's really justice for 30 hours over six months. A huge amount of time. He generously gave us all that time. Unprecedented amount of access for a Supreme Court justice. So the film, we boil it down to two hours, and he tells his very powerful life story directly to camera. Um, with, with stock footage and, and uh, some recreations and archival material, but it's basically just as Tom is telling his story in his own words, and viewers can decide whether they agree with him or not. It's not saying you have to believe him, and he, yeah, but there's some, there's some that really do not want him. I remember that there was a um, there was some you know uproar over the African American Smithsonian that, that opened, right. and they didn't want to put him in there. I was down uh, at the, in Birmingham at the Civil Rights uh, Museum, just going through, and I wasn't even thinking from a political standpoint. But I was surprised that not only did they not have Justice Thomas, they didn't even have Condoleezza Rice in there, but they had Rodney King, and so and and Condoleezza Rice is from Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the girls that died in that in the in the uh, church were her friends. This was, mm. And so I asked the person in charge of the museum, this is interesting that um, these two figures in history are not in this historical mm -hmm. civil rights museum. And he went like really nut crazy on me. So we I mean, we had to leave back. The person who invited me and bought the ticket said, gosh, maybe we should get our money back. And it was really an interesting scene because he was black, I was black, and the people that I was there visiting the museum with were white, and they were just totally embarrassed to see this older black man just yelling at me because I simply asked, um, why isn't Clarence Thomas, who's a sitting justice in here, and or Condoleezza Rice, who is a um, secretary of state. So I'm wondering if there's a real attempt to purge. I think so. As Justice Thomas says in the film, he is the wrong black man mm. in their minds. I had a similar experience in the African American History Museum. After many months of not being all that cooperative, they finally showed us the little exhibit they did have about Justice Thomas mm -hmm. after political pressure. You're right. Mm -hmm. Initially, I think for the first year, there was they didn't nothing. Anything. They had pro people were protesting. And then finally, on. they have this little exhibit, little piece of the, of the Thurgood Marshall exhibit saying, and also Justice Thomas mm -hmm. is a African-American Supreme Court justice. But it's a little piece sort of in the corner. And when we were shown this by the curator who created it and the head of PR, and I, I had not toured the museum yet, I said, okay, so you've minimized mm -hmm. Justice Thomas. You have four floors here, hundreds of exhibits. Are there other conservative there black voices in this museum? And she said, like who? Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean like who? I mean, how about Tom Soule and Walter Williams? And she they looked at me blankly, like right, I had right. never even heard of them. Yeah. And these were the chief curator and PR person. Well, that's why I think we should cancel Black History Month, because if they're going to pick which blacks, then this is all bogus anyway. This is a bunch of liberal liberalism. In the minute we have, oh, go ahead. You but but I was going to say about Tell Black me. History Month. I mean, one thing we really want to do mm -hmm. is get our film in schools for Black History Month. Uh, I, don't, I, mean, I think we should cancel Black History well, Month. Well, I think we but, should cancel it, But I was going to ask you but where you want to go next. So that's where you want to go next, is get your but, film in. <laughs> but in schools, period, okay. whether it's Black History Month or not. Okay, but, okay. but the point really is, if they're going to have it. The, th the films they have now are all about reparations and Black Lives Matter and... Right, right, right. And oh, we're in uh, trouble. So, then, right. so oh, oh, why shouldn't mm -hmm. there be one, just like on the African American History Museum, surely there should be one film, okay. one day, where they talk about a different kind of voice, a different attitude yeah. towards race. And so you're going to... Well, that's your passion now. I'm going to fight my way into this. That's really interesting well, because... Well, and my wife, Gina, luckily, is leading that effort. Oh, but it is a, good. It is a big struggle. Well, it, I think, well, it's a big struggle, but it, I think what you're saying is it's worth the struggle because if they're going to have it, then tell both right. sides. That, why exactly. are we not, why are we pretending that this is a monolithic discussion? And in particular, why are we trying to cancel people out? So I really want to thank you for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It's got international attention that, um, that your, yeah, yeah. your esteemed work in such high places, and now you're getting canceled. <laughs> uh, it's meaningful. And so I think that um, uh, we want to bring these issues to our panel again after this message because 
we have to know what we should be thinking about and doing as you're seeing one by one by one removed from the public square. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Thank today. you, Star. Thank you. I'll be right back. For Cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the Cure, the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. Headquartered in Washington, D.C., Cure works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. Cure's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo Christian perspective. Cure, join with us. There has never been a better time to help black communities. a very distinguished panel to try to help us sort through all of these discussions on the cancel culture. I have with me Terry Jeffrey. He's a longtime editor-in-chief of CNS News. It's a news uh, source for individuals who put a higher premium on balanced news and seeks news that ignores the, the mainstream media. Uh, he formerly was an editor at the Washington Times and Human Events. He studied at Princeton and Georgetown. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining me. I also have Sarah Partial Perry, uh, is a legal fellow for the Edmund Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Sarah joins Heritage after serving as senior counsel for civil rights at the Department of Education during the Trump administration. She formerly worked at the Family Research Center. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Star. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so happy that you're here. In fact, our lives have touched on many instances, they have. especially with your work at these other places. And then Jonathan Alexander, you all know, we already know Jonathan as a constitutional lawyer and senior counsel of governmental affairs for Liberty Council Action. Uh, we have problems, as you know. Uh, some of you are working directly in these challenges that we're confronted with as the, it seems that the aggressive left is making sure that the voices of the right aren't heard at all. Uh, Terry, you work as a journalist here on Capitol Hill. Is, tell us a little bit about what you're sensing going on in the Congress. Uh, how are they thinking about sorting through some of these challenges that, we, as conservatives, we've always been on the side of open markets? Well, I think so far the, the biggest strange thing we've seen on Capitol Hill in recent days, as anybody who drives to Washington, D.C. can see, is the fence they've put around the facility, and it extends beyond the Supreme Court. It comes down Constitution Avenue. It's topped with razor wire. They have, they have military personnel in uniform with semi-automatic weapons on the other side. Can you believe this? And no, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to find out very shortly when or if they're going to take that down or whether they're going to replace it with a permanent fence. But I think that fence is symbolic of something that's going on. Mm -hmm. Although I will say that, uh, you know, the press still has access to the Capitol, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully that better not change. We'll, we'll see what happens in the days ahead. But the, the capital in the, 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 of the United States ought not to be just a place where certain elites, including the media, are given access. Right. All Americans mm -hmm. should have access to the capital, right. just like all Americans should have access to being able to express their views on the internet. That's right. That's exactly right. And, and are you agreeing that that's exactly right? Oh, I could not agree more. And I will say that I think we've identified one of the big bad actors, which is big tech. In all of this. And I think there have been enough discussions about reform of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act where we'll possibly see some momentum. Now, we won't see anything in the House because obviously 
the tables have turned. Mm -hmm. Democrats are not encouraged to change any of the censorship motives right now that have a tendency to be associated with the big left, because these are the individuals, the platforms that give them the most voice, that donate significantly to their reelection campaigns. In fact, back in 2018, Obama's campaign manager was on the record as saying, we outright worked with Facebook to make sure that we were sharing and perpetuating data that would allow people to use the data among family and friends who were undecided. And we saw a 78 percent increase in our use of Facebook and those voters voting for Barack Obama. So there are, I think, direct and very real consequences to the fact that we've had this longstanding relationship with big tech and trusted big tech to do the right thing. But I think now is the time for, for modification. Well, you say modification. Some say regulation. So, Jonathan, these are constitutional questions as well. The right uh, uh, has been usually on the side of business to say, we want open and free markets, but something else is going on deeper here, and the right is in the hot seat. So they're asking government to intervene. What should we be thinking about, especially in terms of how much they overreach when they intervene? Right, and I think it's how you're defining it. Historically, the government protects these areas where there's a free exchange of ideas, this marketplace of ideas. And now we're seeing big tech sort of assume this quasi-governmental role of saying we'll provide uh, a venue for individuals to speak, a platform for you to speak. It's going to be public and that you can freely share information. But then we're going to have sort of non-governmental restrictions on it. We're not going to apply the same rights and freedoms that the government would apply to public parks and sidewalks. We're going to appear that we're doing so, but behind the scenes we're going to be censoring, we're going to be shadow banning. So part of what Section 230, that reform, wants to do is effectively say, hey, you're a channel of communication. You're supposed to provide this free flow of communication, and you can't be the ones picking winners and losers. You can't be the arbitrator of what's truth. We're going to allow the people to do so, as has been historically done in public settings. But Terry, you alluded to something else that's going on here, because this is not just about big tech. It's not just about people's voices and, and, and a few deciding which voice should be in certain places. Uh, we're seeing it in banning of books. We're seeing it in banning of people. We're seeing it in canceling individuals. Then if they speak, they're not even able to uh, keep their jobs, as, we, as our audience has just heard. Define for us a little bit more about what's going on. Is this really uh, just a product of the culture war? Yeah. Well, let me give you a practical example. Uh, Ryan Anderson recently had his book, uh, When Harry Became Sally, removed from Amazon. It had been up there for three years. At, for a while, it had been a best-selling book. When Harry Became Sally. And he wrote the book because we're having this continuous debate about the T in the LGBTQ. I wanted to write the type of book that I could give to one of my liberal classmates from Princeton. I was an undergrad at Princeton. Almost all of my friends for those four years were left-leaning. I wanted to write the type of book that would persuade them that they might want to have second thoughts before they place their child on puberty-blocking drugs, right. before they think that the best solution for gender discomfort is hormones and surgery. So I was shocked on Sunday afternoon when someone trying to buy the book at Amazon you know, reached out to me to say, it's not there anymore. They had been selling it for three years. The book hasn't changed during those three years. So I don't know why it now violates a content policy. And they won't tell us which aspect of the policy it violates or which page of the book, you know, committed the infraction. So it's an entire black box in terms of what did the book get wrong? Why was it objectionable? We have no idea. Ryan Anderson, he's a, he's a very erudite guy. The guy has yeah. an undergraduate degree from Princeton, got a PhD from Notre Dame. My understanding of his book is that it's a very clear, scholarly, and sensitive oh, it is incredible. discussion <laughs> of yeah. this issue. That's but, right. Uh, That's right. That's so, right. So, so, so I think... No, I'm asking questions, scientific questions, that right. we need to address. If we're going to change culture, let's make sure we understand. If we're going to change biological uh, outcomes for individual children, maybe we should have a deeper understanding. Well, so yes, he did do a very deep dive. So well, I'm glad. And like I said, I haven't read that. the book, but there, there is there is an irony star that you're you're uh, pointing to there. That you know the left is always telling us we got to follow the science, embrace yeah. science. <laughs> when you look at this issue that that was discussed in that book, the transgender issue, you know, just like two plus two equals four, and if someone says no, it equals 
equals five. It's not five. No. Two plus two equals four. Yeah. Someone is a male or a female depending on their genetics. Yeah. When a human being is conceived, they, they are male or female. They yeah. cannot change it. Yeah. And if someone comes along and says, you know, you can be a girl, but you're really a male, that's false. Right. And so we have this tremendous movement from the left in American culture where we're all supposed to bow down and pretend that someone who is biologically, genetically, uh, ir ir irreversibly male as a scientific fact, we're all supposed to pretend he's a female right. and change the order of our society. Or not even have the discussion. And I think, yeah. Sarah, that that's where uh, pla places that you're in, Heritage, uh, FRC, even at Department of Ed, at the Civil Rights Office itself, that yes. says, wait a minute. We should have open space to at least discuss these things. That's what university is supposed to be about, which they've already purged. That's what the public square should be about, which now they're purging. And I want you to speak into this as well. But what are your thoughts on where we're going to go? Yes, I was nodding, you know, obviously profusely because I agree with Terry in so many respects, <laughs> not the least of which is science is science. It is immutable. Um, it is not fungible. There is no gender spectrum. And I have to tell you, having worked in the Department uh, of Education in the Office of Civil Rights, we grappled with the onslaught of complaints from biological boys who wanted to compete on girls' teams. Well, that vitiates the entire purpose of Title IX itself, which was passed to give women and, and girls athletic and scholastic opportunities that were equal but separate from males so that they would have their own ability to compete because we understand the physiological differences between males and females. The science represents and supports the fact that they have greater muscle density and they gr have greater uh, bone density and they have greater lung capacity and they just possess athletic advantages that women don't. So this was one of the issues that we grappled with. Title IX itself and Title VI. We also yeah. saw it turned on its head with yeah. critical race theory. Right. So now we can't have open discussions seeing everyone as members of the human race. Instead, we are actually told to see people by the color of their skin, which presented to us the possibility of a Title VI violation. Well, and, and to your point about Title IX, there were even discussions in in-hearing rooms if the act passes in its current form as H.R. 5, then every right that women have fought for will cease to exist. H.R. 5 is a human rights violation. Every person in this country will lose their right to single-sex sports, shelters, grants, and loans. The law will forbid ever distinguishing between women and men. Male rapists will go to women's prisons and will likely assault female inmates. Female survivors of rape will be unable to contest male presence in women's shelters. Men will dominate women's sports. Girls who would have taken first place will be denied scholastic opportunity. Women who use male pronouns to talk about men may be arrested, fined, and banned from social media platforms. Girls will stay home from school when they have their periods to avoid harassment by boys in mixed sex toilets. Girls and women will no longer have a right to ask for female medical staff or intimate care providers. Everything I just listed is already happening. And it's only going to get worse if gender identity is recognized in federal law. So Jonathan, we just heard this testimony, what, what, but it doesn't seem that the Congress is hearing this. What's, what are we going to look forward to in the courts? Is that where this will all end up? Yeah, and I, and I think you know, courts being a reflection of culture, I think the courts are probably gonna be a horrible backstop if they're gonna be the ones yeah. as well determining what folks can say or not say. Courts are good at putting out schemes or frameworks or blueprints. And if they're picking winners and losers and setting up precedent based on individual facts, then they're not going to do a good job. What we have to return to are these basic principles of being able to exchange information in the culture. And what this cancel culture does is effectively punishing people. It's anarchic justice, right? It's a nebulous standard that you can't really define of what's right or what's wrong. Even this conversation is up for grabs as to whether or not it should be canceled or not. Right. And, and it, it's always, <laughs> it probably will be. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, though, because this, this is very serious, what you're even pointing to, because now even judges are coming out, letting us know of their preferences when it comes to their sexual uh, behaviors. I, I think all, all sexual behaviors, adult behaviors, should be private. And now there's this insistence that we're going to teach it to 
first graders, and we're going to teach it from a worldview that's in conflict with the scripture, and then they want to ban the scripture. Now, I know that everyone, oh, no, they haven't banned the Bible yet, but is that where we're going? <laughs> yeah, we've, we've seen a, a law almost passed, uh, this AV law in California, this is two years ago at this time, they wanted to pass a law, and it has to do with the counseling bans, where you're only allowed to give uh, advice to individuals affirming their same-sex tendencies or their uh, transgender identity. If an individual wants to change from their same-sex attraction or no longer wants to behave in a way that is inconsistent with their faith, this law basically said that you can only prescribe one outcome. You can only push them towards that lifestyle. And it said even content or literature that affirms uh, that point of view is not allowed to be presented. And of course, the Bible is the absolute standard that we have in right. upholding uh, you know, one man, one woman marriage and, and biological sex as we've understood it. And so we, we've already seen laws and bills attempted to be passed in okay. California. And of course, it's right. going to make its way across the country. It's going to be interesting when it does, because, you know, the sad part of even that discussion is, as it was taking place and parents were pleading and others were pleading to please pastors just to allow us to counsel, is that the kids themselves, they're confused. There really is a confusion going on and they need truth. So the true tellers, uh, Terry, are usually the media, but something has slipped in. Uh, it, it is, it's the fourth estate. It was in the founding. It was the way that we were supposed to get whatever was going on in our society exposed so that American people can live free. But something has seeped in that we can't even trust the media. We can't trust the courts, and we can't trust the media. No, you can't trust the media, and I don't, you know, I don't think they're the truth tellers. I think that the truth is, if you have conservative and traditional values, if you have biblical values, if you believe in what the Bible says about homosexual behavior, if you believe in what the Bible says about God created man and woman, if you have those views, which are true, they're not only consistent with the Bible, they're consistent with science, then you are someone who's not welcome in the establishment media. That if, if, you, if you graduate from college and you want to be a reporter, and, and you were trained from a child to believe those true values, and when you grew to an adult, you looked at them through your own reason, and you realized, this is true. True. And then you go out and you try and get a job with the New York Times or the Washington Post <laughs> or ABC or CBS News, forget it. And, and if, if you actually got in as a cub reporter, is someone who exhibits that value system going to advance there? Yeah. No. Right. And in fact, right. it, it, they have to surrender it if they want to advance. Well, and that's happening too many, uh, in too many industries right now. And I tell you, it just reminds me again of that same psalm that I keep telling you guys, if the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? So we're going to hear from someone who's been in impacted by this whole canceling in the culture uh, on a very, very large scale. And then I'll come back with my distinguished panel so that we can try to figure out how to cure this problem, figure out what can we do so that the media is a truth teller, so that we will be able to say, OK, I've heard both sides, and now I can go down and deep in my heart and find out what it is that I believe, why I believe it. And so we'll be uh, right back with you after this message. For Cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the Cure, the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. Headquartered in Washington, D.C., Cure works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. Cure's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo Christian perspective. Cure, join with us. And there has never been a better time to help black communities. My distinguished panel, Terry Jeffrey, longtime editor in chief of CNS News. I've got Sarah with me as well, again, legal fellow at the Edwin Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation, and Jonathan Alexandria, our constitutional attorney and senior counsel for 
Government Affairs at Liberty Council. So thank you, uh, guys, because uh, we're in serious trouble, as you just heard. Uh, we've got now movies canceled. <laughs> we've got now uh, hearings that are, are, are being talking to walls. And in fact, uh, Terry, you were telling me coming in that sometimes those senators, they're sitting there talking to empty galleries <laughs> anyway because the right. news is so disconnected from their role to really tell people truth. I do think that they should be out there exposing things so that then we can at least try to find truth. But if they're lying and now they're canceling, what are we going to do, guys? How do we fix this? Well, uh, interesting. I was telling you the story at the, in Trump's first impeachment trial when they were debating it one time into the night. I, ca I was in the chamber watching and I counted the number of people there. Then I called later I called the athletic director at Gonzaga High School because that same night they were playing Good Council High School a few blocks from the Capitol and asked him how many people were at the game. It turned out there were more people at the Gonzaga Good Council High School basketball game <laughs> than were sitting in the Senate chamber watching the impeachment of Donald Trump. Wow. And oh, the president of the United States. Let's take Donald Trump's name out of and just say sure. the U.S. president. And the, international what, attention should have been there, and they're watching a game. And there are literally thousands of credentialed reporters in Washington, D.C. That wasn't yeah. important for them at no, that time. No, it wasn't important. They've already made up their mind. That's it, it, the problem. Exactly. They've should, already made up I'll their mind. I'll just say to that impeachment, that, that is a magnanimous example of cancel culture right there to yes. say you know to say that and it's the worst form of cancel culture when you pair what the culture wants with state action and so for the first time we're seeing the state actually put teeth to this cancel culture saying we don't want that man to be able to run again we don't want him wow. to even have secret service that's the worst form of of, uh, of cancel culture now state this is interesting it. because i am one that believes okay we're talking private sector we can build out machinery to to compete and then may the best man win. I mean, I believe in the marketplace, but this is really interesting perspective that now we have the government. This was government canceling, which we already know is happening. They're having hearings over in energy and commerce to say, how, because congressmen are saying, you need to cancel these networks. You need to not put them on your platform. Sarah, this is getting really serious. It is, it is. And you, you asked the question how to solve the problem. And I think one of the things that the cultural revolution has wrought is the opportunity for us to build our own platforms. That's why CNS News, for example, great example of an alternative platform where we can be truthful about what is actually taking place. We understand that there is one narrative coming out of the legacy media. If we don't provide the alternative, it's going to be unbalanced as long as it exists. So I think about Gina Carano, who was canceled uh, from The Mandalorian on Disney+. Plus. Money talks, and it is very loud. So we well, canceled our Disney Plus subscription. Well, that's fine, and we can boycott ourselves into non-existence, and or we can try to compete. And I mean, let's face it, some of the books that were canceled by the major publishers are being picked up by, by others that are um, in more conservative spaces. But I'm now still on this information that um, Jonathan's bringing, that not if government's behind it, right. not if they start to pressure uh, corporations to say, you're, you're out of here. I, th I think that's where we have to be very judicious about how we watch what our elected representatives are doing. I don't think we're in an age where we can afford to sit back idly, elect someone, and then just walk away. I think we have to be very cognizant of what transpires on Capitol Hill, because there is a subtle shifting in the culture of this country, and it's not for the better. It is the to better. the hard left. And I think we have to be very aware of what our representatives and our senators are doing. Well, That's here's it. what one of them is saying. And the San Francisco Board of Education said the Diane Feinstein Elementary School will no longer be named after Senator Feinstein, a liberal icon, not good enough because 37 years ago, she said something the cancel culture doesn't like. That's how ridiculous, that's how dangerous this is. And the latest one is Mr. Vanderveen, who did a great job defending the president. He's face it now. But if we don't push back on this and stop it and stand up, as Mr. Dershowitz said, stand up for the Constitution and the First Amendment, it will only get worse. And so this is the yeah. number one issue for the country to address today. And Jonathan, is it going to, is the message going to get through? Are the few that are saying, wait just a minute, we need to try to look at this? Is, is, are the alternatives only to regulate or, or, or is there something else that we should be thinking about? Yeah, and it's, it's finding, rooting it out from where it is. Uh, I remember a hearing on, on Capitol Hill where uh, 
two government agencies, both the FBI and the DOJ, relied on the Southern Poverty Law Center mm -hmm. and addressed their hate list as being, almost copying and pasting their hate list as being what evidence they were going to use during this particular hearing. And so you're seeing government agencies go out and find these rogue actors that obviously hate the right, obviously hate conservative talk, and using government action in order to promote it. And not only is, is that a, a danger, one of the things that we can do and we had to do uh, was send demand letters and saying, hey, you can't continue to use this. Uh, get them on defamation suits saying that you you know you can't speak a false word against organizations just because you disagree with them you can't put that out in publication is it making headway i mean are we winning some of these because it would seem like this is a dangerous uh road to say that one organization that does have bad will and rooted a lot in that critical race theory that you brought up earlier uh sarah been using uh black interests and 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 black people to push this case for this secular totalitarian Totalitarian agenda. I'm wondering, are we getting any traction to say, no, 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 we're going to fight you, Southern Poverty Law Center. We're going to fight you um, that are that are now demanding that we empty the space of anybody Christian, anyone conservative. Absolutely. And even if the final determination by the court doesn't fall on that side, certainly it's a public opinion victory. Anytime you're able to air your grievance out in public and allow individuals to weigh the two sides. I mean, even Proverbs says that one man speaks and, you know, that's considered Sounds truth. Good. Until, until <laughs> so someone comes the other and side. That, In fact, that's how we, we got our we, system. We have, we have it's like you got to add the mouth of two Three witnesses, the word is established, and, and, uh, and we need to hear the other side. And so, Tara, I want to know from you then, okay, CNS, um, Sarah mentioned what your, your guys are doing in this space. Tell us a little bit about, more about are there those alternatives growing? They are, and uh, you know, I agree with what Jonathan just said. I think it's key to expose what the left is doing and trying to silence conservative voices through social media. And but there's a catch-22 there. I think it's a job. You know, the, the liberal media isn't going to report it, so no. the conservative media needs to report it. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you from my own experience, but there's conservative media um, support push it into the mainstream of public. Right. We have to get it out there in, in public discussion, and obviously there. There are, there are avenues for conservatives like talk radio and so forth that, that are there, but another big avenue is, in fact, Facebook and Twitter. Okay. And, and we get our stories out a great deal. We have a very massive Facebook audience. We have a big Twitter audience. We get our stories out through Facebook and Twitter. So there's Cash 22 there. Right. If they come and try and close us down, right. we're in serious trouble. So what now? To be, what, is the, what is the answer? Because that is what's happening. And so yeah. many people have built their platforms or on their on these secular platforms. Well, well, In fact, there's a breaking story right now that uh, one of, Instagram, they built their whole company around this Instagram and they told them, uh-uh, you quick, violated Quickly, one, one thing is competition. If you have a Twitter, you have to have a parlor. But if you have a Facebook, What's the competitor to Facebook? So that's the space that needs to be built now. That's where I suppose this is going to, to the marketplace. Uh, it's to get our own clouds. Is that what has to happen? Are we going to revisit? So, and in fact, Sarah, we, uh, the Civil Rights Office, it must have been a fascinating place because now it seems that this whole movement, the critical race theory and everything else, is moving us from, they said that they were trying to solve problems with separate but equal, and now we're moving back to separate but equal. Is that what we're going to do, just separate and have two different societies going on? I think we need to identify critical race theory for what it is, which is Marxism. Their entire MO is to dismantle traditionalism, the Judeo-Christian value and ethic, and anything that stems from what they perceive to be authoritarian, when in fact what you're doing is you're perpetuating anarchy. In fact, we had a few directed investigations where we were looking at situations at universities where the individuals were separated by race in the RA program. Program, blacks or those who identified as black. That's an entirely different show, I'm sure. And then whites, they were each given a separate training and the whites were given a training on how they were all racist. Mm -hmm. They all had bias. They were all privileged. They all had implied fragility and they needed to be less white. And looking at this from a strict civil rights standpoint, by the letter in an academic standpoint of the law for Title VI, we go, well, I'm sorry, but that looks to us like a violation uh -huh. of determinations by race. That's exactly so, right. And, and that has flipped, but I'm thinking even deeper for Christians and Bible yes. believers and the Orthodox that it's even more damaging because there we can fight. But when you think about 
shared space. Yeah. Can secularism, hardcore Marxist secularism, coexist with biblical truth? Is this something that is going to have to separate? Well, I think. Or can we yeah. have one country? Well, I, th I think inductive would be you know, some that Martin Luther King always says, truth crushed to earth will rise again. You know, a lot, no lie can live forever. What the American ethic has always been, and it's difficult for American Christians because we believe in absolute truth, mm -hmm. but we live in a society where we allow room for folks that we know are wrong to speak as well, mm -hmm. but we hold on to our absolute truth and we keep speaking it. And that's, that's the thing. We can't recess from the culture. We can't disengage from the okay. culture. And at as so you're same, saying that fight into it. Don't do not do the whole separate thing. Build your own platforms yes. and stuff, but keep fighting for the culture. Ab, because, ab, ab, but, and, you know, and I think that he's on to something, too, because if we don't, you know, people, well, we'll just separate on out as Christians. Then we're missing the part of our mission to go out and make right. disciples. We're missing Ooh. people that really need to hear the Lord. Ooh, you know, yeah. as uh, Jonathan mentioned, Martin Luther King, if you read Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail, one of the greatest documents in American political life of the 20th century, he, he cited St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, and two Roman Catholic saints, but he cited the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. The Declaration of Independence that our country founded on appealed to the laws of nature and nature's God. That's right. And it said all men are endowed by their creator, creator with certain inalienable rights. So that the foundation of this country is based on an understanding that the law itself, on justice itself, must be rooted in God's law. And so if you have an atheist... Hallelujah! Go ahead. If you have an atheist secular culture, it yeah. can't be America. That's exactly because right. Because it's rejected our fundamental principles. Uh, amen. Yes, I think you might agree with that. Oh, I do. I do. Once well, what again, can a you lot add of to it? Because that is the culture war. That's what it we're is. up against, guys. It that is. is defined right there. I, so I guess the question is, are we going to fight? Are we going to fight for oh, the future of the country? I think we absolutely have to. You know, Paul wrote about being in the world, but not of the world. And I think that's what we have to do. And I agree with both of these gentlemen. I think we absolutely have to stick to our guns, but we have to be fearless in proclaiming truth. Because there isn't your truth and my truth there is one immutable truth, and that is the Word of God. Yeah. So if we're not willing to bend, which we aren't, we can continue to proclaim the truth in love, even though it's going to be difficult during this cultural revolution, but it's what we're called to do. We're called yeah. to do it, 30 the, seconds. The disciples in Acts 4 were said, you cannot go out and proclaim Christ anymore. And what they say, well, we have nothing else that we can, we can offer. There's nothing else that we can speak of. Yeah. We have to obey God rather than men. We're going to keep talking about what we know is true. And they loved it, and they did it, and we're excited, and I'm excited that they did because I got saved. I was really, I was a mess. I needed it and I needed to hear it and I needed to be able to hear it. So thank you for keeping it in the public square, uh, 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 Terry, because Terry Jeffrey, and you can read him. And Sarah, thank you, thank uh, you. FRC, and now over at Heritage, and Jonathan, of course, our regular uh, from Liberty Council. I'll be right back with some final thoughts. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Right now, we're in Alaska unloading a hospital for uh, COVID-19. But right now, our country is in trouble, and people are scared, people are afraid, and we see the violence and the injustices that are taking place. Only God can change this. Uh, this is a problem of the human heart, and we have sinned against God, and as a nation, we've turned our back on God. And I want you to know that God loves you, He cares for you, and He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to this earth to take our sins. And if we'll confess them and repent, turn from them and believe on His Son, Jesus Christ, God will forgive us and He'll heal our hearts. If you have never invited Christ into your heart, pray this prayer with me right now to say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry, forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son. I want to trust Him as my Savior. I want to follow Him as Lord from this day forward forever. Amen. Uh, call that number right now that's on the screen. We've got someone who will pray with you, talk with you, and encourage you. God bless. It's time for a cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, D.C., CURE works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. CURE's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo-Christian perspective. CURE, join with us. There has never been a better time to help black communities. Well, you've heard a lot of compelling stories and a lot of compelling information so that we can think through this cancel culture. There are powerful voices on the institutional left that claim that there is no such thing as cancel culture. 
But today's disagreements are no longer simple dissent, but backed up with punishment. The victims of cancel culture are generally not powerful people. They're often vulnerable people who suffered devastating harm, like Calvin Cochran. He lost his job. He had to sue the city of Atlanta. Thankfully, won the case. But could he win his reputation back? He didn't get his job back. So what do we do in a culture that is more antagonistic to a biblical worldview than ever before? Should Christian people apologize for believing the scriptures? Should they cower in shame to the politically correct forces? You know, a great song that some know is called Surrounded, and it says that this is how we fight our battles, that our weapons are praise and thanksgiving to God. Our Christian witness in the public square is important. It's powerful. People actually get saved by it. So we must continue to stand for truth, despite the arrows that may come against us. But we must also know that there is a cancel culture battle. It's real and it's here. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Right now, we're in Alaska unloading a hospital for uh, COVID-19. But right now, our country is in trouble and people are scared, people are afraid, and we see the violence and the injustices that are taking place. Only God can change this. Uh, this is a problem of the human heart and we have sinned against God. And as a nation, we've turned our back on God. And I want you to know that God loves you, He cares for you, and He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to this earth to take our sins. And if we'll confess them and repent, turn from them and believe on His Son, Jesus Christ, God will forgive us and He'll heal our hearts. If you have never invited Christ into your heart, pray this prayer with me right now to say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry, forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son. I want to trust Him as my Savior. I want to follow Him as Lord from this day forward forever. Amen. Uh, call that number right now that's on the screen. We've got someone who will pray with you, talk with you, and encourage you. God bless. It's time for a cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, D.C., CURE works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. CURE's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo-Christian perspective. CURE, join with us. There has never been a better time to help black communities. watching another episode of Cure America with Star Parker. And I hope that you will continue to think with me every week as we dive into national issues of culture, race, and poverty. They're in the headlines. Cure America with Star Parker is made possible by the generosity of our Cure family of friends that contribute to our nonprofit umbrella organization, the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. It's a policy institute based here in Washington, D.C. CURE is a 501c3 tax-exempt organization, so we welcome you to join our family of friends and sponsors to help expand our policy, our media, and our clergy programs. We want to reach more people to fight poverty and to restore dignity through messages of faith, freedom, and personal responsibility. I hope you also write me a note. If you want to share any thoughts or ideas, go ahead and email me. Now, may our good Lord bless you and keep you and may it shine his light upon you and upon the life of all of those that you love.